Another fascinating phenomenon closely related to the OBE, out-of-body experience, is the NDE, or near-death experience. The NDE is essentially the ultimate OBE, occurring at the moment of physical death. Throughout history, people who have died and later been resuscitated report the same story of consciousness leaving their physical body, entering a realm of love and light, meeting angelic beings, and watching their entire lives flash before their eyes. Slight differences exist in various accounts of NDEs, but these pale next to the incredible universal similarities. The typical NDE is as follows. Michael Talbot wrote, A man is dying, and suddenly finds himself floating above his body and watching what is going on. Within moments, he travels at great speed through a darkness or a tunnel. He enters a realm of dazzling light and is warmly met by recently deceased friends and relatives. Frequently he hears indescribably beautiful music and sees sights, rolling meadows, flower-filled valleys, and sparkling streams, more lovely than anything he has seen on earth. In this light-filled world he feels no pain or fear, and is pervaded with an overwhelming feeling of joy, love, and peace. He meets a being and or beings of light who emanates a feeling of enormous compassion and is prompted by the beings to experience a life review, a panoramic replay of his life. He becomes so enraptured by his experience of this greater reality that he desires nothing more than to stay. However, the being tells him that it is not his time yet and persuades him to return to his earthly life and re-enter his physical body. Dr. Raymond Moody wrote, A man is dying and as he reaches the point of greatest physical distress, he hears himself pronounced dead by his doctor. He begins to hear an uncomfortable noise, a loud ringing or buzzing, and at the same time feels himself moving very rapidly through a long, dark tunnel. After this, he suddenly finds himself outside of his own physical body, but still in the immediate physical environment, and he sees his own body from a distance, as though he is a spectator. He watches the resuscitation attempt from this unusual vantage point and is in a state of emotional upheaval. After a while, he collects himself and becomes more accustomed to his odd condition. He notices that he still has a body, but one of a very different nature and with very different powers from the physical body he has left behind. Soon, other things begin to happen. Others come to meet and to help him. He glimpses the spirits of relatives and friends who have already died and a loving, warm spirit of a kind he has never encountered before, a being of light, appears before him. This being asks him a question, non-verbally, to make him evaluate his life, and helps him along by showing him a panoramic, instantaneous playback of the major events of his life. At some point, he finds himself approaching some sort of barrier or border, apparently representing the limit between earthly life and the next life. Yet he finds that he must go back to the earth, that the time for his death has not yet come. At this point he resists, for by now he is taken up with his experiences in the afterlife and does not want to return. He is overwhelmed by intense feelings of joy, love, and peace. Despite his attitude, though, he somehow reunites with his physical body and lives. Considering the fact that hallucination is the usual skeptical argument against NDEs, it is important to note that the main features are amazingly consistent. The hallucination always begins by finding oneself in a non-physical body somewhere near your now lifeless physical body. At this point, your consciousness becomes more expansive than ever. All sensation and perception becomes incredibly lucid. You can hear the thoughts and feel the feelings of everyone around, and you can travel at the speed of thought. Eventually, the physical world begins to fade as you proceed to float through a luminous tunnel, walk up a long staircase, cross a narrow bridge, or other such transitional archetypal scene. In Greek mythology, all newly deceased souls crossed the river Styx on a ferry boat from the world of the living to Hades, the world of the dead. After transitioning from the world of the living, you begin to see or feel the presence of deceased friends and relatives, angels so-called light beings, who communicate telepathically and send overwhelming emanations of love. You are then shown a full-spectrum playback of your entire life, 
accurate to the finest detail, which you re-experience from this space of expanded consciousness, able to think, feel, and fully understand not only yourself, but everyone you have ever interacted with in life. You feel the betrayal of a cheated spouse, understand your enemies, realize your true friends, and so on. You feel and experience the consequences of your actions on everyone else. Ultimately, you are told or decide to come back to the world of the living and find yourself stuck in your physical body right at the moment of your resuscitation. This seems like quite a coherent, meaningful, and oft-repeated sequence of events to be so casually labeled hallucination. Dr. Raymond Moody wrote, It was nothing like a hallucination. I have had hallucinations once, when I was given codeine in the hospital. But that had happened long before the accident which really killed me. And this experience was nothing like the hallucinations, nothing like them at all. I tried to tell my minister, but he told me I had been hallucinating, so I shut up. I tried to tell my nurses what had happened when I woke up, but they told me not to talk about it, that I was just imagining things. So in the words of one person, you learn very quickly that people don't take to this as easily as you would like for them to. You simply don't jump up on a little soapbox and go around telling everyone these things. Adrian Cooper wrote, Some people later choose to relate their NDE experiences to doctors, relatives, and friends. However, it is likely the vast majority do not, often believing, for example, they will not be believed, or worse, are considered to have been hallucinating due to the anesthetic or other medical factors associated with the medical situation, or suffering from after-effects arising from the physical condition leading to the NDE. Other people are afraid to relate NDE experiences on the basis they might be considered to be mentally deranged or will be ridiculed. To most people experiencing an NDE, relating the experience to others seems pointless, the experience itself being so intensely profound and personal. Research has proven, however, that literally millions of people have experienced an NDE, most of which are described as deeply profound, life-changing experiences. Regardless of many so-called experts claiming the contrary, no near-death experiencer ever considers their NDE to have been a hallucination. In fact, universally, near-death experiencers report the experience to be more real than this reality and like returning home. Not to mention, during the NDE, these patients were indeed clinically dead and showing zero brain activity, which fundamentally sets NDEs apart from traditional hallucinations. Furthermore, there are hundreds of documented cases in which near-death experiencers come back to life and report in detail actual events that occurred while they were dead and out of body. This obviously conflicts with the notion that NDEs are mere hallucinations. Michael Talbot wrote, Although the orthodox view of NDEs is that they are just hallucinations, there is substantial evidence that this is not the case. As with OBEs, when near-death experiencers are out of body, they are able to report details they have no normal sensory means of knowing. For example, Moody reports a case in which a woman left her body during surgery, floated into the waiting room, and saw that her daughter was wearing mismatched plaids. As it turned out, the maid had dressed the little girl so hastily she had not noticed the error, and was astounded when the mother, who did not physically see the little girl that day, commented on the fact. In another case, after leaving her body, a female near-death experiencer went to the hospital lobby and overheard her brother-in-law tell a friend that it looked like he was going to have to cancel a business trip and instead be one of his sister-in-law's pallbearers. After the woman recovered, she reprimanded her astonished brother-in-law for writing her off so quickly. Dr. Raymond Moody wrote, Several doctors have told me, for example, that they are utterly baffled about how patients with no medical knowledge could describe in such detail and so correctly the procedure used in resuscitation attempts, even though these events took place while the doctors knew the patients involved to be dead. In several cases, persons have related to me how they amazed their doctors or others with reports of events they had witnessed while out of the body. While she was dying, for example, one girl went out of her body and into another room in the hospital where she found her older sister crying and saying, Oh, Kathy, please don't die, please don't die. The older sister was quite baffled when later, Kathy told her exactly where she had been and what she had been saying during this time. To date, 
there are hundreds of independently verified and documented cases in which near-death experiencers have come back to life accurately reporting events that happened in other rooms, buildings, or places while they were dead. Even more astonishing, there are several cases in which blind near-death experiencers have gained sight while out of body and given detailed, visually accurate accounts of their surroundings. Near-death experience researcher Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross interviewed many such clinically blind patients who were able to see perfectly while dead and out of body. She wrote that, to our amazement, they were able to describe the color and design of clothing and jewelry the people present wore. Stanislav Graf wrote, Raymond Moody, Kenneth Ring, Michael Sabom, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and other highly respected researchers have repeatedly confirmed that people in near-death situations have had out-of-body experiences, during which they were able to witness events happening in other rooms or even distant places. These accounts have been objectively verified by independent observers. The ultimate challenge to Newtonian science in this area of research has been the discovery that clinically blind people experiencing OBEs describe scenes that are visually accurate, though after recovering from the disease or trauma that caused the near-death experience, they are not able to see. If near-death experiencers are clinically dead, and all brain activity has ceased, yet they still retain regular memory and cognitive function, then the orthodox explanation of consciousness arising from the brain must be incorrect. If out-of-body experiencers and near-death experiencers are comatose, with their eyes closed or blind, yet they still experience regular vision while out of body, then the orthodox explanation of sight arising from eyes must also be incorrect. Moreover, not only do near-death experiencers retain their sight, memory, and cognitive functioning, but they universally report them to be expanded and deepened. This strongly suggests that consciousness, the ability to see, remember, and have an inner witness to the external world, is intangibly inherent in nature and not created by or confined to biological structures. It suggests that our brains, eyes, and nervous systems act not as creators of consciousness, but rather as receiver-transmitters of consciousness. It suggests that consciousness is an objective, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent underlying field of awareness received and transmitted by various subjective biological organisms in various degrees on various frequencies. It suggests that we all channel objective universal mind, God, into subjective packets of awareness to experience and participate in creation. David Icke wrote, People who have near-death or out-of-body experiences describe how they could still see while they were looking down at their bodies lying on the operating table, or wherever. If we see with our eyes, or indeed even with our brain, how come we can see without them? Dr. Raymond Moody is the psychologist and medical doctor who actually coined the term near-death experience in his 1975 book Life After Life. After conducting interviews and an in-depth study of 150 patients who had clinically died and come back, Dr. Moody became a firm believer in life after death. Since then, he has written nearly a dozen more intriguing books on the subject. His research identifies nine experiences common to almost all near-death experiences. 1. Hearing sounds such as a buzzing. 2. Feeling absolute peace and painlessness. 3. Having an out-of-body experience. 4. Traveling through a tunnel. 5. Rising into the heavens. 6. Seeing angels or dead relatives. 7. Meeting a spiritual being such as God. 8. Seeing a review of one's life. 9. Feeling reluctant to return to life. Dr. Moody's research also focuses on the after-effects near-death experiences have on people mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. His patients came back from their near-deaths with many epiphanies, new paradigms, and lifestyle changes, all of them positive. For instance, most near-death experiencers came back with a more jovial, relaxed demeanor, a more sincere, loving, forgiving, appreciative attitude, and became less worldly and more intuitive, less materialistic and more spiritual. Stanislav Graf wrote, One of the most important aspects of Moody's study is his discussion of the effects the near-death experiences had on the lives of these individuals. They felt that their lives had broadened and deepened. 
they developed serious interest in ultimate philosophical and spiritual issues, and started pursuing quite different values in life than before. Existence suddenly appeared much more precious, and much more emphasis was put on a full experience of the present moment, on the here and now. There were deep changes in the concept of the relative importance of the physical body and the mind. Rarely, this was associated with the development of psychic abilities. Michael Talbot wrote, One last piece of evidence of the reality of the NDE is the transformative effect it has on those who experience it. Researchers have discovered that near-death experiencers are almost always profoundly changed by their journey to the beyond. They become happier, more optimistic, more easygoing, and less concerned with material possessions. Most striking of all, their capacity to love expands enormously. Aloof husbands suddenly become warm and affectionate, workaholics start relaxing and devoting time to their families, and introverts become extroverts. These changes are often so dramatic that people who know the near-death experiencer frequently remark that he or she has become an entirely different person. There are even cases on record of criminals completely reforming their ways, and fire and brimstone preachers replacing their message of damnation with one of unconditional love and compassion. Near-death experiencers also become much more spiritually oriented. They return not only firmly convinced of the immortality of the human soul, but also with a deep and abiding sense that the universe is compassionate and intelligent, and this loving presence is always with them. Perhaps the most amazing and fascinating aspect of NDEs is that no one ever wants to come back to life, and once they do, they lose all fear of death. The beauty, the wonder, the feelings of absolute bliss and contentment experienced on the other side are so compelling that everyone wishes nothing more than to stay. Inevitably, though, once they do come back, they are never again afraid to die. Near-death experiencers are not afraid to die because they have personally experienced the continuation of consciousness beyond physical death, and this gnosis alleviates any fear. Dr. Moody commented on this phenomenon, saying that, as one might reasonably expect, this experience has a profound effect upon one's attitude towards physical death, especially for those who had not previously expected that anything took place after death. In some form or another, almost every person has expressed to me the thought that he is no longer afraid of death. Here are just a few testimonies from Dr. Moody's patients. 1. I am thoroughly convinced that there is life after death, without a shadow of a doubt, and I am not afraid to die. I am not. Some people I have known are so afraid, so scared. I always smile to myself when I hear people doubt that there is an afterlife, or say, when you're dead, you're gone. I think to myself, they really don't know. I've had many things happen to me in my life. In business, I've had a gun pulled on me and put to my temple, and it didn't frighten me very much, because I thought, well, if I really die, if they really kill me, I know I'll still live somewhere. 2. When I was a little boy, I used to dread dying. I used to wake up at night crying and having a fit. My mother and father would rush into the bedroom and ask what was wrong. I told them that I didn't want to die, but that I knew I had to, and asked if they could stop it. My mother would talk to me and tell me, no, that's just the way it is and we all have to face it. She said that we all had to do it alone and that when the time came, we would do it all right. And years later, after my mother died, I would still talk about death with my wife. I still feared it. I didn't want it to come. But since this experience, I don't fear death. Those feelings vanished. I don't feel bad at funerals anymore. I kind of rejoice at them, because I know what the dead person has been through. 3. Now I am not afraid to die. It's not that I have a death wish or want to die right now. I don't want to be living over there on the other side, now because I'm supposed to be living here. The reason why I'm not afraid to die, though, is that I know where I'm going when I leave here, because I've been there before. Dr. Moody comments that the reason why death is no longer frightening, as all of these excerpts express, is that after his experience, a person no longer entertains any doubts about his survival of bodily death. It is no longer merely an abstract possibility to him, but a fact of his experience. Many of Dr. Moody's patients have actually ceased using the word death altogether, insisting that if by death one means the annihilation of consciousness, then death is a misnomer. It does not exist. 
Moody seems to agree with this assertion, as evidenced by the title of his first NDE book, Life After Life. One of his patients stated, Some say that we are not using the word death because we are trying to escape from it. That's not true in my case. After you've once had the experience that I had, you know in your heart that there is no such thing as death. You just graduate from one thing to another, like from grammar school to high school to college. Adrian Cooper wrote, NDE, OBE, and astral projection are all experiences reproducing what will happen to each and every person at the point of physical death, resulting in a profound knowing of the truth of the higher realities and the continuation of life after the death of the physical body. Anyone enjoying these experiences will profoundly know beyond any doubts that the state known as death is not final, but is rather the continuation of a much greater adventure, the next stage in life as an immortal spiritual being of the multidimensional universe. In 1981, Gallup performed a telling poll which found that 8 million adult Americans, over 5% of the population, had experienced an NDE. This massive figure means that if NDEs are mere hallucinations, as the orthodox establishment would have us believe, then they are absolutely epidemic mass hallucinations, affecting millions and millions. Is this even plausible? In 1982, Dr. Michael Sabom, the cardiologist OBE skeptic turned believer from last chapter, collated five years of interviews with patients brought back to life after clinical death. Out of these 78 patients, 40% of them, without being prompted, reported experiencing a typical NDE. Irvin Laszlo wrote, What Sebaum discovered, much to his surprise, was the level of commonality expressed by those who reported NDEs, one that has remained consistent throughout all such subsequent research. Often the experience involves the person traveling through a tunnel to an all-encompassing light that innately feels loving and blissful, to be met by departed loved ones, or archetypal or iconic figures. There's an expansion of awareness, regularly accompanied by a non-judgmental but frank life review, and sometimes appearing to be by personal choice, and other times by a gentle but firm mandate, the person is made to return to his or her life, often with the profound sense of having to complete a mission. Dr. Sebaum found there was no difference in religious convictions between near-death experiencers and non-near-death experiencers nor was there any difference in being previously aware of the existence of such experiences. In fact, more patients who had NDEs were previously unaware of the existence of NDEs than those who were already aware of them. Dr. Sebaum's research concluded that NDEs happen regardless of expectation, religion, culture, or creed. Michael Talbot wrote, Near-death experiencers also have no unique demographic characteristics. Various studies have shown that there is no relationship between NDEs and a person's age, sex, marital status, race, religion, and or spiritual beliefs, social class, educational level, income, frequency of church attendance, size of home community, or area of residence. NDEs, like lightning, can strike anyone at any time. The devoutly religious are no more likely to have an NDE than non-believers. In 1990, pediatrician Dr. Melvin Morse first became interested in the NDE phenomenon after interviewing 12 young children recently resuscitated from cardiac arrest, and eight of them reporting NDEs. Over the next 10 years, Dr. Morse interviewed every cardiac arrest survivor at his hospital. Time and time again, he heard the same story recounted. The patients found themselves outside their physical bodies, watched the doctors scramble to resuscitate them, were drawn into a mystical tunnel and greeted by angelic light beings. Michael Talbot wrote, Dr. Melvin Morse, a pediatrician in Seattle, Washington, first became interested in NDEs after treating a seven-year-old drowning victim. By the time the little girl was resuscitated, she was profoundly comatose, had fixed and dilated pupils, no muscle reflexes, and no corneal response. Despite these odds, she made a full recovery, and when Morse looked in on her for the first time, after she regained consciousness, she recognized him and said that she had watched him working on her comatose body. When Morse questioned her further, she explained that she had left her body and passed through a tunnel into heaven where she had met the Heavenly Father. The Heavenly Father told her she was not really meant to be there yet, 
and asked if she wanted to stay or go back. At first she said she wanted to stay, but when the Heavenly Father pointed out that that decision meant she would not be seeing her mother again, she changed her mind and returned to her body. Morse was skeptical, but fascinated, and from that point on set out to learn everything he could about NDEs. Dr. Pim Van Lommel is another leading cardiologist who became convinced there is life after death due to hearing the NDE accounts of so many patients. In 2001, he interviewed 344 heart patients at his Netherlands hospital who had been clinically dead for at least five minutes. 62 of them, or 18%, reported having lucid OBEs or NDEs and could recall in detail specifics of what happened during their time spent dead out of body. Since 2001, Van Lommel has resigned his post as practicing cardiologist to pursue his research into NDEs. David Icke wrote, Dutch cardiologist Pim Van Lommel produced a massive study of near-death experiences that supported the whole concept of life after death, as well as raising questions about DNA, the collective unconscious, and the idea of karma. His findings were published in the British medical journal The Lancet. Van Lommel's interest was sparked 35 years ago when a patient told him about her near-death experience, but his serious study only began after he later read a book called Return from Tomorrow, in which the American doctor George Ritchie detailed his own experience of near-death. Van Lommel began to ask all his patients if they remembered anything during their cardiac arrests. In one popular case, a female near-death experiencer found herself moving towards the light at the end of the tunnel and saw a friend of hers coming back the other way. As they passed each other, the friend telepathically communicated that he had died but was being sent back. Confused, the woman continued down the tunnel only to eventually be sent back herself. Upon resuscitation, she discovered that her friend had suffered cardiac arrest at approximately the same time and vividly remembered seeing and communicating with her as well. Here are a few quotes from some of Van Lommel's other patients about their NDEs. 1. I became detached from the body and hovered within and around it. It was possible to see the surrounding bedroom and my body, even though my eyes were closed. I was suddenly able to think hundreds or thousands of times faster and with greater clarity than is humanly normal or possible. At this point, I realized and accepted that I had died. It was time to move on. It was a feeling of total peace, completely without fear or pain, and didn't involve any emotions at all. 2. I was looking down at my own body from up above and saw doctors and nurses fighting for my life. I could hear what they were saying. Then I got a warm feeling, and I was in a tunnel. At the end of that tunnel was a bright, warm, white, vibrating light. It was beautiful. It gave me a feeling of peace and confidence. I floated towards it. The warm feeling became stronger and stronger. I felt at home, loved, nearly ecstatic. I saw my life flash before me. Suddenly I felt the pain of the accident once again and shot back into my body. I was furious that the doctors had brought me back. This experience is a blessing for me, for now I know for sure that body and soul are separated and that there is life after death. It has convinced me that consciousness lives on beyond the grave. Death is not death, but another form of life. 3. During my NDE, I saw a man who looked at me lovingly, but whom I did not know. Later, at my mother's deathbed, she confessed to me that I had been born out of an extramarital relationship, my father being a Jewish man who had been deported and killed during the Second World War, and my mother showed me his picture. The unknown man that I had seen years before during my near-death experience turned out to be my biological father. Dr. Van Lommel notes in his research that at the moment of their deaths, not only are near-death experiencers conscious, but their consciousness becomes more expansive than ever. They are able to think hundreds of times clearer and quicker than normal, and remember every detail of their lives since childhood, yet all the while they are clinically dead and showing zero brain activity. This raises the obvious philosophical question, if consciousness is merely a byproduct of brain activity, as the scientific materialist establishment would have us believe, then how is it possible for millions of people to experience these phenomena? Whether they are authentic visits to the afterlife or merely hallucinations, either way, near-death experiences defy the orthodox theory that consciousness arises from brain activity. 
Just like Dr. Moody, Dr. Van Lommel found that his patients lost all fear of death after coming back from their NDEs, and the reason for this, Dr. Van Lommel says, is because they have experienced that their consciousness lives on, that there is continuity. Their life and their identity don't end when the body dies. They simply have the feeling they're taking off their coat. Dr. Rick Strassman wrote, The NDE may climax with emerging into an indescribably loving and powerful white light that emanates from the divine, holy, and sacred. This leads to a mystical or spiritual experience in which time and space lose all meaning. Those who undergo an NDE feel embraced by something much greater than themselves or anything they previously could have imagined, the source of all existence. There's a certainty that consciousness exists after death. Those who reach the mystical level of the NDE emerge with a greater appreciation for life, less fear of death, and a reorientation of their priorities to less material and more spiritual pursuits. The sense of reality of what near-death experiencers see and feel is undeniably certain, and it's common to hear expressions like, it was more real than real. It is difficult for those coming back from an NDE to describe it. They often say it is beyond language. My good friend Chris Wilshaw from the Tao Wow blog experienced an NDE while traveling abroad in India many years ago. Near the end of his visit, he became very ill, weak, and unable to keep food down for over a fortnight, after which he died. Chris wrote of that fateful evening, At some point that night, I knew for sure I was dying. I knew when I was close to death. I knew the point I had accepted death. I knew for certain, as with all of these stages, each one, what they were and what they meant. And I knew when I was dead. The bliss and completeness were unput into wordable, and I have accepted that now years on. The experience is with me now, but language does not exist to paint it. During his NDE, which he emphasizes was a death experience, not a near-death experience, Chris went through most of Dr. Moody's nine stages. He did not hear any buzzing or beautiful music, but did feel absolute peace and completeness, lifted out of his physical body, traveled through a tunnel upwards to the heavens, and met some notable astral beings. He encountered a man painting statues of deities who claimed to be the inventor of Hinduism. He sat in silent meditation with the Buddha. He interacted with a female Gaia entity. And finally, quote, reached a point of no beings, no separations, and pure completeness, no room for God, no duality. Amazingly, when Chris came back into his body the next morning, he was completely healthy, had a full appetite, and felt all his energy replenished. Now, looking back at his NDE, he recounts a few basic truths that were shown to him. The basics of the truths that were clearly made to me that night are that all is this, one, perfect. Life and death are nothing but ideas. The idea of separate self is an idea. We are like nodes of a complete net, and each node is the whole net. But for this experience, only sees as far as the next few nodes. Beyond that is mystery. Yet beyond that is infinity. And if anything is infinite, it is also you. You're infinite. You are me as I am you, as we are one. The one. Life and death are not separate, but one action. The universe, the infinite, whatever you call it, is living. It has beings. These beings come and go, but their coming and going are not life or death. An infinite number of beings have been born and will be born. An infinite number of beings have died and will die. Yet in all of this living and dying, the infinite had no beginning and will have no end, and that infinite is you. As for overcoming the fear of death, I asked Chris, are you less afraid or unafraid of death now? To which he replied, What people fear is the thought of those left behind and the dissolution and end of their ego. Death is easy for the one who dies and hard on the ones left behind. It would be a great gift to let every person on earth know that when someone dies, this is not sad and not an end. That way both of these fears could be removed. No concern for those left behind and no last wrestling with the ego. The NDE is a very powerful experience that does clear up these human concerns. It would indeed be a gift if it could be given. Death is not an end, and is no bad thing. If I died now, I would die peacefully and in bliss. Dr. Moody only recently coined the term near-death experience in the 1970s, 
but the NDE phenomenon has a long-standing history with documented examples going back thousands of years. Michael Talbot wrote, Like OBEs, NDEs appear to be a universal phenomenon. They are described at length in both the 8th century Tibetan Book of the Dead and the 2,500-year-old Egyptian Book of the Dead. In Book 10 of the Republic, Plato gives a detailed account of a Greek soldier named Ur, who came alive just seconds before his funeral pyre was to be lit, and said that he had left his body and went through a passageway to the land of the dead. The Venerable Bede gives a similar account in his 8th century work, A History of the English Church and People, and in fact, in her recent book, Other World Journeys, Carol Zaleski, a lecturer on the study of religion at Harvard, points out that medieval literature is filled with accounts of NDEs. In Book 10 of the Republic, Plato recounted the story of a Greek soldier named Ur, who died on the battlefield and came back to life almost ten days later, just as his body was about to be incinerated. Ur awoke with a start and began describing what he had seen on the other side. He said his soul left his physical body and joined with a group of other spirits who led him upwards through a passageway to the afterlife. There the other souls were taken by divine light beings and shown detailed life reviews. Er himself was shown many sights, but not his life review, and was ultimately sent back and told to inform others on earth about what he experienced in the afterlife realm. Amazingly, this two and a half thousand year old story sounds exactly like modern NDE accounts. Dr. Raymond Moody wrote, According to Plato, the soul comes into the physical body from a higher and more divine realm of being. For him, it is birth which is the sleeping and the forgetting, since the soul, in being born into the body, goes from a state of great awareness to a much less conscious one, and in the meantime forgets the truths it knew while in its previous out-of-body state. Death, by implication, is an awakening and remembering. Plato remarks that the soul that has been separated from the body upon death can think and reason even more clearly than before and that it can recognize things in their true nature far more readily. Furthermore, soon after death, it faces a judgment in which a divine being displays before the soul all the things, both good and bad, which it has done in its life, and makes the soul face them. Plato's mentor Socrates' belief in the afterlife was so strong that he actually looked forward to his own death with curiosity and excitement. Socrates said that death was simply the separation of soul from body, and an awakening from illusion to reality, this five-sense world being the illusion, and reality existing on the higher, non-physical planes. This is consistent also with the Egyptian and Tibetan books of the dead, which suggest that immediately following death we assume a ka, or bardo, spiritual body, which transcends the ordinary limitations of time, space, and matter. Dr. Raymond Moody wrote, in the Tibetan account, the mind or soul of the dying person departs from the body. At some time thereafter, his soul enters a swoon, and he finds himself in a void, not a physical void, but one which is, in effect, subject to its own kind of limits, and one in which his consciousness still exists. He may hear alarming and disturbing noises and sounds, described as roaring, thundering, and whistling noises, like the wind and usually finds himself and his surroundings enveloped in a gray, misty illumination. He is surprised to find himself out of his physical body. He sees and hears his relatives and friends mourning over his body and preparing it for the funeral, and yet when he tries to respond to them, they neither hear nor see him. He does not yet realize that he is dead, and he is confused. He asks himself whether he is dead or not, and, when he finally realizes that he is, wonders where he should go or what he should do. A great regret comes over him, and he is depressed about his state. For a while, he remains near the places with which he has been familiar while in physical life. He notices that he is still in a body called the Shining Body, which does not appear to consist of material substance. Thus, he can go through rocks, walls, and even mountains without encountering any resistance. Travel is almost instantaneous. Wherever he wishes to be, he arrives there in only a moment. His thought and perception are less limited. His mind becomes very lucid, and his senses seem more keen and more perfect and closer in nature to the divine. If he has been in physical life blind or deaf or crippled, he is surprised to find that in his shining body all his senses, as well as the powers of his physical body, have been restored and intensified. 
he may encounter other beings in the same kind of body, and may meet what is called a clear or pure light. The Tibetans counsel the dying one approaching this light to try to have only love and compassion towards others. The book also describes the feelings of immense peace and contentment which the dying one experiences, and also a kind of mirror in which his entire life, all deeds, both good and bad, are reflected for both him and the beings judging him to see vividly. In this situation, there can be no misrepresentation. Lying about one's life is impossible. In short, even though the Tibetan Book of the Dead includes many later stages of death, which none of my subjects have gone so far as to experience, it is quite obvious that there is a striking similarity between the account in this ancient manuscript and the events which have been related to me by 20th century Americans. The Bible also contains stories of typical near-death experiences, such as Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul was a persecutor of Christians until receiving his famous vision and conversion. Acts 26 describes how Paul saw a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me. He then heard the voice of Jesus speaking to him, asking, Why persecutest thou me? The voice then tells Paul that he has appeared to him for a purpose, to make him a minister and a witness of God. Dr. Raymond Moody wrote, This episode obviously bears some resemblance to the encounter with the being of light in near-death experiences. First of all, the being is endowed with personality, though no physical form is seen, and a voice which asks a question and issues instructions emanates from it. When Paul tries to tell others, he is mocked and labeled as insane. Nonetheless, the vision changed the course of his life. He henceforth became the leading proponent of Christianity as a way of life, entailing love of others. 1 Corinthians 15 gets even more specific regarding the life after death state. It is asked, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? To which it is answered, That there are both terrestrial bodies and celestial bodies, natural bodies and spiritual bodies. In death, the scripture says, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Dr. Raymond Moody wrote, Interestingly, Paul's brief sketch of the nature of the spiritual body corresponds very well with the accounts of those who have found themselves out of their bodies. In all cases, the immateriality of the spiritual body its lack of physical substance is stressed, as are its lack of limitations. Paul says, for example, that whereas the physical body was weak and ugly, the spiritual body will be strong and beautiful. This reminds one of the account of a near-death experience in which the spiritual body seemed whole and complete, even when the physical body could be seen to be mutilated, and of another in which the spiritual body seemed to be of no particular age, i.e. not limited by time. In 1688, the Leonardo da Vinci of his era, Swedish mystic Swedenborg, was born. He spoke nine languages, and was a successful mathematician, politician, astronomer, and businessman. He built watches and microscopes, invented prototypes for the submarine and airplane, and wrote books on diverse subjects ranging from physics and chemistry to color theory and metallurgy. Michael Talbot wrote, Throughout all of this, he also meditated regularly and when he reached middle age, developed the ability to enter deep trances during which he left his body, and visited what appeared to him to be heaven, and conversed with angels and spirits. That Swedenborg was experiencing something profound during these journeys, there can be no doubt. He became so famous for this ability that the Queen of Sweden asked him to find out why her deceased brother had neglected to respond to a letter she had sent him before his death. Swedenborg promised to consult the deceased, and the next day returned with a message which the queen confessed contained information only she and her dead brother knew. Swedenborg performed this service several times for various individuals who sought his help, and on another occasion told a widow where to find a secret compartment in her deceased husband's desk in which she found some desperately needed documents. So well known was this latter incident that it inspired the German philosopher Immanuel Kant to write an entire book on Swedenborg, entitled Dreams of a Spirit Seer. Swedenborg's descriptions of his out-of-body experiences in the afterlife realm, just like Plato's, the Bible's, and the Egyptian and Tibetan books of the dead, all closely parallel descriptions given by modern-day near-death experiencers. He mentions going through a tunnel, being greeted by telepathic, loving angels, 
seeing landscapes more beautiful than Earth, and being subjected to an extensive life review. All in all, Swedenborg wrote nearly twenty volumes about his out-of-body experiences. On his deathbed, Swedenborg was asked if there was anything he wanted to recant, to which he replied, Everything that I have written is as true as you now behold me. I might have said much more had it been permitted to me. After death, you will see all, and then we shall have much to say to each other on the subject. Dr. Raymond Moody wrote, How is it we might well ask ourselves that the wisdom of Tibetan sages, the theology and visions of Paul, the strange insights and myths of Plato, and the spiritual revelations of Swedenborg all agree so well, both among themselves and with the narratives of contemporary individuals who have come as close as anyone alive to the state of death. Shamans the world over, throughout history, have spoken of visiting the spirit world, or afterlife realm, regularly, conversing with sentient entities and deceased souls, then bringing visions and messages back to the living tribesmen. They believe that in the other realm, one possesses a subtle body, it is populated by many spiritual teachers, and it is a world created by the thoughts and imaginations of many people. Amazonian shamans use the psychedelic brew ayahuasca to transport them into this realm. The Persian Sufis enter a deep trance-like meditation in order to visit this land where spirits dwell, and the Australian aboriginals regularly enter this realm during group meditations called dream time. Michael Talbot wrote, The picture of reality reported by near-death experiencers is remarkably self-consistent and is corroborated by the testimony of many of the world's most talented mystics as well. Even more astonishing is that as breathtaking and foreign as these subtler levels of reality are to those of us who reside in the world's more advanced cultures, they are mundane and familiar territories to so-called primitive peoples. For example, Dr. E. Nandisvara Nayaki Thero an anthropologist who has lived with and studied a community of Aborigines in Australia, points out that the Aboriginal concept of the dream time, a realm that Australian shamans visit by entering a profound trance, is almost identical to the afterlife planes of existence described in Western sources. It is the realm where human spirits go after death, and once there, a shaman can converse with the dead and instantly access all knowledge. It is also a dimension in which time, space, and the other boundaries of earthly life cease to exist, and one must learn to deal with infinity. Because of this, Australian shamans often refer to the afterlife as survival in infinity. Virtually all of the world's shamanic traditions describe a spirit world or alternate dimension reached during states of altered consciousness, which they maintain is where souls travel after physical death. Shamans are experts at navigating these inner realms, and they regularly use deep meditation, ecstatic dance, ingestion of entheogens, and other methods of shifting consciousness in order to enter them. In many tribes, the prerequisite to becoming a shaman is having a near-death experience. The Seneca, the Sioux, the Yaku, the Zulu, the Kikuyu, the Guajiru, the Mudang, the Eskimos, and many other tribal societies all have traditions of shamans assuming the role after a life-threatening illness brings them face to face with the afterlife spirit world. Stanislav Graf wrote, Most non-Western cultures have religious and philosophical systems, cosmologies, ritual practices, and certain elements of social organization that make it easier for their members to accept and experience death. These cultures generally do not see death as the absolute termination of existence, they believe that consciousness or life in some form continues beyond the point of physiological demise. Whatever specific concepts of afterlife prevail in different cultures, death is typically regarded as a transition or transfiguration, and not as the final annihilation of the individual. Mythological systems have not only detailed descriptions of various afterlife realms, but frequently also complex cartographies to guide souls on their difficult posthumous journeys. University of Toronto psychology professor Joel Witten has successfully used hypnosis to regress dozens of patients to the time before their birth and published his findings in the book Life Between Life. In this between-life state, his patients universally reported all the classic features of NDEs, including passage through a tunnel, entering a light-filled realm outside of space and time, encountering deceased relatives or spirit guides, and being subjected to an extensive life review. 
Dr. Joel Witten wrote, The message from deep trance is that life after death is synonymous with life before birth, and that most of us have taken up residence in this other world many, many times as disembodied entities. Subconsciously, we are just as familiar with discarnate existence as we are with the earth plane. The next world is both the state we have left behind in order to be born, and the state to which we return at death. As the wheel of life revolves, birth and death happen repeatedly in the evolution of the individual. Death is no more than the threshold of consciousness that separates one incarnation from the next. Truly, there is life between lives. Subjects whose religious backgrounds are as varied as their initial prejudices for or against reincarnation have testified consistently that rebirth is fundamental to the evolutionary process in which we are enveloped. At death, they say, the soul leaves the body to enter a timeless, spaceless state. There, our most recent life on earth is evaluated, and the next incarnation is planned according to our karmic requirements. Several NDE researchers, such as Dr. Kenneth Ring, author of Life at Death, have pointed out that the holographic universe model offers a way of understanding these experiences as ventures into the more frequency-like aspects of reality. For instance, many patients describe their experiences as entering a realm of higher vibrations or frequencies where everything is made of light and sound. The sounds are described as celestial music, more like a combination of vibrations than actual sounds, and the lights are described as more brilliant than any on earth, but despite their intensity do not hurt the eyes. Dr. Ring believes these and other observations provide evidence that the act of dying involves our consciousness being shifted away from the ordinary explicate world of appearances into the implicate holographic reality of pure frequency. Michael Talbot wrote, Ring is not alone in his speculations. In the keynote address for the 1989 meeting of the International Association for Near-Death Studies, Dr. Elizabeth W. Fenske, a clinical psychologist in private practice in Philadelphia, announced that she too believes that NDEs are journeys into a holographic realm of higher frequencies. She agrees with Ring's hypothesis that the landscapes, flowers, physical structures, and so forth of the afterlife dimension are fashioned out of interacting or interfering thought patterns. I think we've come to the point in NDE research where it's difficult to make a distinction between thought and light. In the near-death experience, thought seems to be light, she observes. Another decidedly holographic feature of NDEs is the commonly reported notion that, in the afterlife realm, time and space as we know them cease to exist. Near-death experiencers have reported that it has to be out of time and space. It must be, because the experience cannot be put into a time thing, and I found myself in a space, in a period of time, I would say, where all space and time was negated. It seems inside this four-dimensional holographic universe, our consciousness experiences the explicate movement of space and the passage of time, using a holographic physical body to navigate. Outside the hologram, however, consciousness experiences the implicate at-one-ment of all space, time, and matter. Many have reported that in the afterlife realm, they didn't even have a body unless they were thinking. One near-death experiencer said, If I stopped thinking, I was merely a cloud in an endless cloud, undifferentiated. But as soon as I started to think, I became myself. Michael Talbot wrote, In addition to those mentioned by Ring and Fenske, the NDE has numerous other features that are markedly holographic. Like out-of-body experiencers, after near-death experiencers have detached from the physical, they find themselves in one of two forms, either as a disembodied cloud of energy, or as a hologram-like body sculpted by thought. When the latter is the case, the mind-created nature of the body is often surprisingly obvious to the near-death experiencer. For example, one near-death survivor says that when he first emerged from his body, he looked something like a jellyfish, and fell lightly to the floor like a soap bubble. Then he quickly expanded into a ghostly three-dimensional image of a naked man. However, the presence of two women in the room embarrassed him, and to his surprise, this feeling caused him suddenly to become clothed. That our innermost feelings and desires are responsible for creating the form we assume in the afterlife dimension is evident in the experiences of other NDEers. People who are confined in wheelchairs in their physical existence find themselves in healthy bodies that can run and dance. 
Amputees invariably have their limbs back. The elderly often inhabit youthful bodies. And even stranger, children frequently see themselves as adults, a fact that may reflect every child's fantasy to be a grown-up, or, more profoundly, may be a symbolic indication that in our souls some of us are much older than we realize. Perhaps the most holographic aspect of NDEs is the life review. Dr. Ring calls it a holographic phenomenon par excellence. Many near-death experiencers themselves have used the term holographic to describe the experience. It was an incredibly vivid, wrap-around, three-dimensional replay of my entire life, said one near-death experiencer. It's like climbing right inside a movie of your life, said another. Every moment from every year of your life is played back in complete sensory detail. Total, total recall. And it all happens in an instant. The whole thing was really odd. I was there. I was actually seeing these flashbacks. I was actually walking through them. And it was so fast. Yet it was slow enough that I could take it all in. Thus, the experience is holographic both in its panoramic three-dimensionality and also in its incredible capacity for information storage. Near-death experiencers lucidly re-experience every single thought and emotion of not only their lives, but the thoughts and emotions of everyone else they ever came in contact with. They feel the joy of people who they treated kindly, and the pain of people they treated poorly. No thought or emotion, theirs or anyone else's they ever knew, remains private. Michael Talbot wrote, in fact, the life review bears a marked resemblance to the afterlife judgment scenes described in the sacred texts of many of the world's great religions, from the Egyptian to the Judeo-Christian, but with one crucial difference. Like Witten's subjects, near-death experiencers universally report that they are never judged by the beings of light, but feel only love and acceptance in their presence. The only judgment that ever takes place is self-judgment, and arises solely out of the near-death experiencer's own feelings of guilt and repentance. Occasionally, the beings do assert themselves, but instead of behaving in an authoritarian manner, they act as guides and counselors whose only purpose is to teach. This total lack of cosmic judgment, and or any divine system of punishment and reward, has been and continues to be one of the most controversial aspects of the NDE among religious groups but it is one of the most oft-reported features of the experience. What is the explanation? Moody believes it is as simple as it is polemic. We live in a universe that is far more benevolent than we realize. That is not to say that anything goes during the life review. Like Witten's hypnotic subjects, after arriving in the realm of light, near-death experiencers appear to enter a state of heightened or metaconscious awareness and become lucidly honest in their self-reflections. It also does not mean that the beings of light prescribe no values. In NDE after NDE, they stress two things. One is the importance of love. Over and over they repeat this message, that we must learn to replace anger with love, learn to love more, learn to forgive and love everyone unconditionally, and learn that we in turn are loved. This appears to be the only moral criterion the beings use. The second thing the beings emphasize is knowledge. Frequently, Near-death experiencers comment that the beings seemed pleased whenever an incident involving knowledge or learning flickered by during their life review. Some are openly counseled to embark on a quest for knowledge after they return to their physical bodies, especially knowledge related to self-growth or that enhances one's ability to help other people. Stanislav Grof wrote, Many dying individuals have reported encounters with other beings, such as dead relatives or friends, guardian spirits, or spirit guides. Particularly common seem to be visions of a being of light, which usually appears as a source of unearthly light, radiant and brilliant, yet showing certain personal characteristics, such as love, warmth, compassion, and a sense of humor. The communication with this being occurs without words, through an unimpeded transfer of thoughts. In the context of this encounter, or outside of it, the dying individual can experience a partial or total review of his or her life, which almost always involves vivid colors and a three-dimensional dynamic form. The message from this experience seems to be the realization that learning to love other people and acquiring higher knowledge are the most important values in human life. People on their deathbeds will often speak of seeing angels, deceased friends or family, seeing bright warm lights of love, or having their entire lives flash before their eyes. 
these visions begin to reconcile traditional notions of heaven and the afterlife with the actual experiences of current and historical near-death experiencers. It appears the seeming finality of death truly is a physical phenomenon only, and consciousness lives on forever. Adrian Cooper wrote, I would like to commence this section by emphatically stating an extremely important truth which everyone should know and understand beyond any possible doubt. There really is no such state as death. What many people believe to be the finality of death is in fact no more and no less than the transition from one state of life and reality, that of the physical matter, to a state of life of a vastly finer density of the universe.